Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Second Saturday Animals Edition. Uh, my name is Aldo here at the Harold Washington Library, and I'm super excited for today's program. Um, I hope everyone's ready to meet some furry critters. Uh, we have not one, but two special guests today on the program, uh, the Lincoln Park Zoo and Animal Quest. And for those of you watching live at home, please comment and participate throughout the show. I can bring up your comments so our guests can see them. Um, they're always happy to, to participate with all the families watching at home. Um, and if you like any of the books being featured today, please be sure to look out for links to these books being posted by my buddy Christina. She'll be posting links in the comments so you can check out any of the, the fun books that are being read. Uh, every month, um, we have a book list that also goes along with all of our activities. So be sure to check those out. Uh, and then I'm going to go over really quick what programs and activities we have in store for you today. So we're going to start things off with the story time uh, by Justice here at the Thomas Hughes Children's Library. Then Miss Megan will teach us how to make a bee hotel. Then we'll be joined by Animal Quest, who I think brought along a special friend. And we'll do a live stream to the Lincoln Park Zoo and I'll learn a little bit about what they have going on right now. Uh, then Liv will be on to talk about some great books that uh, have some animal themes going on with them. And then we'll send it to John, who will do a really fun drawing activity uh, to close out the show. Um, so, all right, is uh, everyone ready to go on an animal adventure? Uh, let's start things off with my buddy, Justice. Take it away, Justice. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Justice, and I am at the Thomas Hughes Children's Library all the way downtown at Harold Washington Library Center. And it is second Saturday. Um, today's themes is animals, as you may see with my little bear friend there. And we're gonna get started with our hello, hello song. We're gonna clap our hands, we're gonna spin around. I'm gonna turn my arms and we're gonna stomp on the ground and reach up to the sky. So let's get started. Can you wave hello? Can you clap your hands? Hello, hello. Can you clap your hands? Can you stretch your touch the sky? Can you touch your toes? Ooh, touch your little toes. Can you turn around? Can you say hello? Hello. Can you clap your hands? Nice and loud. in the morning they always say hello and what does the cow say correct moo moo and that is what they say let's see who our next friend is does anyone know what this is little bull peep maybe a nice little hint yes a sheep when sheep wake up in the morning, they always say hello. When sheep wake up in the morning, they always say hello. And what does the sheep say? Yes, that, that, and that is what they say. Ooh, let's see where our third friend is. What beautiful pink skin. What kind of animal is this? Yes, a pig. When pigs wake up in the morning, they always say hello. When pigs wake up in the morning, they always say hello. And what does the piggy say? Yes, oink, 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 oink. 
And that is what they say. Let's say hello to our last friend. And what is this? Yes, a duck. When ducks wake up in the morning, they always say hello. When ducks wake up in the morning, they always say hello. And what does the duck say? Correct, correct, you are so smart. Quack, 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 quack. And that is what they say. Good job, everyone, saying hello to our animal friends. All right, if you're ready for a story, clap your hands. If you're ready for a story, clap your hands. If you're ready for a story, if you're ready for a story, if you're ready for a story, clap your hands. Good job. We will be reading The Curious Cares of the Bears by Douglas Florian and illustrated by Sonia Sanchez with permission to read by the Little Bee Books Publishing. Let's take a look. The cares of the bears are curious indeed, as you will discover if you care to read. In springtime, there's carefully climbing up trees and stealing the honey from beehives of bees. Bears do love honey. There's chasing and racing for hours and hours, stopping from time to time just to smell the flowers. Of course, there is horsing around with each other, teasing your sister or wrestling your brother. In summer, they're swimming inside of a creek, playing jump rope or perhaps hide and seek. Come out, come out wherever you are. When relatives visit, you'll see big bear hugs and feasting on berries, beetles, and bugs. Oof, doesn't sound too good to me, but to bears, it must be delicious. Then parting heartily, dancing all night, howling and growling until morning light. Huh, how many bears do we see on these two pages? Let's count. We have one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven bears partying heartily, dancing all night, howling and growling until morning light. According to legend, bears care to go hiking. 55 miles or more than mountain biking. On hazy hot days, there is lazying in lakes. And leaving the water, there are great big bear shakes. In autumn, there's playing and leaves all day long. Then building a campfire and sharing a song. When winter winds blow, then they go in a den. When deeply they sleep, where deeply they sleep till the springtime, and then, then what? They slowly emerge as the frozen grounds thaw and start to explore the wide world with awe. And that was The Curious Cares of the Bears of Bears um, by Douglas Florian and illustrated by Sonia Sanchez. Thank you for listening, everybody. Now we're going to go into another bear song. And now we are ready to do a felt board activity with a song called The Bear Went Over the Mountain. If you know it, you can sing along.
lovely, lovely song about a bear wandering and discovering. Say bye, bear. Bye, bear. Goodbye, tree. Goodbye, forest. Goodbye, river. Goodbye, mountain. All right, and now we're gonna say hello to two little bluebirds. One named Jack and one named Jill. And they're sitting on a beautiful green hill. Two little bluebirds sitting on a hill. One named Jack and one named Jill. Fly away, Jack. Fly away, Jill. <laughs> Come back, Jack and come back Jill. Hmm. What else do we see here? Huh, I see a stick. Birds love sitting on sticks. Two little blue birds sitting on a stick. One named Slow and one named Quick. Fly away, Slow. Fly away, Quick. Come back, Slow. Come back, Quick. Hmm, what else do we have on our board? I see a gate. Two little blue birds sitting on a gate. One named Early and one named Late. Fly away, Early. Fly away, Late. Come back, Early. Come back, Late. Ooh, let's fix our guy. What else do we have up here? Ooh, clouds. Birds love flying among the clouds. Two little blue birds sitting on a cloud. One name quiet and one name loud. Fly away, quiet. Fly away, loud. Come back, quiet. Come back, loud. <laughs> Good job, everybody. Let's say goodbye to our friends. Goodbye, blue birds. Goodbye, cloud. Goodbye, gate. And goodbye, stick. And goodbye, green hill. And that is it for our story time at the Thomas Hughes Children's Library. Again, my name is Justice, and I am so happy that you guys are here and enjoy the rest of Second Saturday. Wave goodbye. Bye, bye, goodbye. Bye, 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 goodbye. Can you clap your hands? Welcome to Second Saturday. I'm librarian Megan with the STEAM team, and I want to talk to you about animals, but you know what? I'm actually talking about insects. So insects fall under animals. So I'm going to read to you one of my favorite animal books, Bee Dance, by Rick Krastowski, and this is published by Henry Holt & Co., and that is an imprint of Macmillan Publishing. So, thank you. When sunlight warms your honeybee wings, off you go on flower patrol. Now, does anybody know what this is called? It might look different than what you usually think of when you think of this word. Sometimes kids tell me it looks like a set of drawers and they are not wrong. It is actually a beehive and that's where bees live. Follow a sweet scent floating on the air to find a honey bee gold mine. Now, what do bees like? What would be a gold mine? What do you think this pink might be? Hmm. A prairie 
in bloom. So the prairie, actually where we live in Chicago, used to be a prairie just like this. Sip sugary nectar with your bendy straw tongue. Ooh, can we pretend we're sipping nectar? <laughs> Yum. Race home. So back to the hive. Line the bees wax comb. Excitement buzzes all around. The other bees know that you have news. Do the waggle dance, honeybee. All right, I'm gonna teach you how to do this. So make a figure eight. So make a figure eight with your finger. Just like that, all right. Now twirl in a circle. Wag your body up the middle run. Then twirl around the other side. And buzz, buzz, buzz. Spoilers. Waggle faster, honeybee, Ooh, okay. Buzz louder, buzz louder, Bzzz. Your dance points the way to the prairie. How long you waggle your body tells the other bees just how far to go. So the bee is giving directions. Now the bees know just where to fly. Soon they see flowers reaching towards the sky. Can you reach towards the sky? Good job. Go to work, forager bees. Collect nectar to make honey. Stuff pollen into baskets on your hind legs. So that's what that is. Those are, that's the pollen. And when they bring the pollen to the other flowers, it helps make more flowers. Isn't that neat? Stay out late. It's like the sun is setting. Carry your heavy prize back to the hive. The last glow of sunset lights the way home. Unload your cargo and store it in the combs, then settle in for the night. All right, can we yawn? Because I think the bees are sleeping. Oh, oh, good night, bees. When you wake up, warm your honeybee wings in the morning sun and dance the prairie jitterbug once again. The end. So now you might not think of honeybees as being endangered, but in fact, in 2018, 40% of bee colonies died. And now this is happening because bees are losing their habitat to farms and cities becoming bigger. But there are actually things that you yourself can do at home anytime. So you can plant flowers and bees like flowers. They, that makes them real happy. And especially if in this area you plant prairie flowers. And another thing that you can do is you can make a bee hotel, which is what I'm going to show you right now. Now to make a bee hotel, you can just use things that you probably can find around your house. So you can use, I'm using a jar today, but you could also use a can or one of my friends actually used an old coffee mug that broke. So just anything that's cylindrical and open. You also need a paper bag, a marker or a pencil. I'm using a marker today, something thin like this, some glue, pair of scissors and you can use yarn or ribbon or string or twine anything like that all right so to get started we are going to take our paper bag and open it up and then we're just going to cut down we're basically just cutting the bottom off so we're going to cut down the side and then cut around the edge
got the bottom off. Okay. Now the next part is you're going to take your jar or your can or your mug or whatever you're using and you're going to take your marker and you're going to basically use it to measure the width or the height of it. And you're just going to want to make it a little shorter than the item that you're using. And I'm just going to do that down my entire paper bag. have to be super exact. Next, you're going to see that line. And you're just going to cut a straight line down your paper bag. And you're just going to do that for every space where you made a line mark. You're just gonna keep doing that. So I think I cut some before, so I think I actually already have enough. So I have seven. All right. The next part you're gonna do is you don't need this entire length. So you're just gonna fold it in half and cut it like that. And then fold it in half again. So each strip should make about four squares. So the next part, you're going to take your squares and you're going to take your marker and your glue. And now you're just going to roll your paper up around your marker or your pencil or whatever you're using. And then once you're about half an inch to the bottom, you're gonna take just a little bit of glue, just a thin line, and you're just going to roll it the rest of the way. Now you don't wanna roll it too tight or it's gonna be hard to get off the marker. And then you're just gonna slide it off and you have a little itty bitty straw. So you're gonna just keep doing that until you have a bunch of straws, like, like I do. <laughs> I might have been doing this earlier. And then once you have enough, you're just gonna start filling your jar or your can or whatever you're using up with those straws. So you can maybe make a bunch and then start filling it up and then you can see how much more space you still have to go. Mine took about 24 straws, but depending on the size of the container you're using, it'll take a different amount. And there you go. So that is your bee hotel. So now, so orphan bees, so bees that have lost their colony, or we also have different types of bees like woodcutter bees, um, or sorry, leafcutter bees, or um, mason bees that are kind of solitary bees. They don't live in a hive like other bees. And so this will be great for them because they can lay their eggs in here. So the last step, so you're just gonna take a little bit of yarn and you're just going to wrap it around your bee hotel. Make a nice, tight knot. And this way, you can hang your bee hotel up outside when summer comes or spring, and the bees can find your hotel. 
All right, well, thank you for joining me for Second Saturday. And if you want a more fun environmental saving ideas, you can join me for Earth Engineers every Thursday at 4.30. Thanks, bye. Hi everyone, it's Mr. John here. I am um, excited to welcome a special guest today. I'm here with Steve from Animal Quest, and he has a special friend with him as well. Steve is here today to give us a little sneak preview of what we can expect during Animal Quest's live Zoom program, which is gonna be on March 23rd, which is a Tuesday at 4.30 p.m. How's it going, Steve? It's going all right, how you doing? Good. Can you tell us about uh, your friend here? Yeah, her name is Daphne, and she's called a Striped skunk it's one of the most common skunks you're going to find throughout uh, the united states you can find them all, all throughout north america yeah i guess the obvious question is uh what does your your friend smell like like a skunk <laughs> yeah they do have a unique smell uh i don't really know how to describe it besides mm -hmm. skunk like uh it's not so, it's really not bad though yeah and that smell is different from the the spray that they uh spray out right Yes, yeah. So if we look at her rear end here, so they have these glands in their butt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and basically they can sort of squeeze them to spray this nasty concoction in your general direction. Uh, but she cannot spray me. Oh, how come? So when we have uh, when we have skunks in zoos, typically when they're little babies, the veterinarian does this, uh, this procedure is called descenting. Uh, so basically they just take the little glands out of their butt so they can't spray anymore. Uh, they're actually a cousin of the ferret. And oh, if wow. you have a pet ferret, your uh, ferret is also typically descented, so it does not spray you either. Oh, wow. I had no idea ferrets did that also. That's right. How old is your skunk, actually? How old is she, Jess? She's like two years old now. She's pretty big. Yes, she's very well fed. <laughs> I know we often, um, sometimes we'll see skunks in our neighborhoods. Where else do skunks live if they're not living in the city, or do they mostly live in the city now? These guys live absolutely everywhere. So again, you can find them almost throughout North America and just about every habitat you can imagine. Uh, but yeah, anywhere where there's food readily available, which is basically everything and anything, so what you call an opportunistic omnivore. Uh, so if it tastes good, they will eat whatever that thing is. Uh, and they usually will kind of either, well, if they have a, a pre-existing sort of burrow, uh, to, to hang out in, they use these lovely little claws to dig out one if they need. Uh, but Usually that uh, in the city scenario, that'll end up being like under your patio, mm -hmm. deck, things like that. It's kind of under the sidewalk. Uh, but yeah, literally everywhere. Yeah, you said she's an omnivore, so that means she'll, she'll eat pretty much anything she finds, right? That's right. They'll eat dead animals. They'll eat bugs. They'll eat uh, things out of your garden. Uh, they'll eat uh, small mammals and frogs and things they find, all kinds of stuff. Are there any other uh, cool facts you can share with us about her? Uh, well, let's see. They can spray from about ooh, 10 feet away, uh, but they only have about 10 or so sprays before they have to take a couple days off to regenerate. Uh, so usually if you run into a skunk, they don't really want to waste their spray on you. So if you uh, if you stay calm and don't freak out uh, and let them know that you're there and move away slowly, uh, often they will try not to spray you if they can help it. Well, that's really cool. She's, a, she's actually a very beautiful skunk. Thank you for uh, bringing her. So I did mention that we have a live Zoom program coming up on Tuesday, March 23rd at 4.30 p.m. If uh, any of our viewers are interested in joining, you can go to our website, shypublib.org, and search for the event Animal Quest. Um, Steve, can you tell us about some animals that might show up during that live program? Oh, you might be able to see a hedgehog, uh, this mm -hmm. thing called a Kawada Mundi, maybe a rabbit, maybe a parrot, snakes, lizards, turtles, tortoises, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a real grab bag. That sounds awesome. And it's going to be a live program, so um, we'll have time for kids to ask you questions and everything, right? That's right. The more the well, that, sounds, yeah, that sounds awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. It was really nice meeting you, little guy. Yes. Right, I'm sorry, what is, what is your name again? Daphne. Daphne. It was nice meeting you, Daphne. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone, please, I encourage you to register for our event. Um, Registration is open now. Um, and we have limited slots, so please check out our website and search for Animal Quest through the events to register. We'll see you on Tuesday, March 23rd at 4.30 p.m. See you then. Thanks so much, Steve and Daphne. Thank you, guys. Bye.
Bye. Everyone, it's Mr. John. I'm actually here live now. Just a little uh, reminder that there's still plenty of room if you want to register for our special event on Tuesday, March 23rd at 4.30 with Animal Quest. We'll have um, Steve back with a bunch of uh, many other cool live animals, and you'll be able to ask him questions about the animals that show up. Just uh, head over to our website and search for the event Animal Quest, and you'll be able to register. Um, as Aldo mentioned earlier, we actually have another special guest with um, some animal friends. So I'm going to see if our friend Jordan from the Lincoln Park Zoo is ready to join us now. Hey Jordan, how are you? Hi, how are you? I am doing great this morning. I get to talk about some of my favorite animals at the zoo. So thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. What do you, um, um, who, who do you have with you today? I have some crowned lemurs. So um, I'll give you a little bit of information just about who I am and where I am today um, to give the viewers a little bit of context. And then for the rest of the program, I'm just going to turn my camera around because all the good stuff is on the other side of the glass right now. Awesome. Um, so uh, as he said, my name is Jordan. Um, I am an educator here at Lincoln Park Zoo, and I am so happy to be with your, you here today. Um, it's this is actually a very special occasion because I'm inside one of the buildings that's not currently open to the public. So I'm inside the Helen Brack Primate House. So this primate house is home to lots of different types of primates. We have lesser apes, monkeys, and prosimians. Um, prosimians are going to be some of the animals we're going to see today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn my camera around. Give me just one second here. Okay, and then I'm going to turn my camera around here. Um, so I would love to introduce you to some of our friends, the crowned lemurs. So you can kind of take a nice close look here. There are three individuals who are in this space with us today. Now, I'm not sure how many people are super familiar with lemurs. They just happen to be my very favorite animal in the entire world. So I am extremely excited um, to talk about them today. And lemurs are a type of primate, which you may have guessed since we are inside the primate house. If you've never seen them before, they are very unique looking. So I'll kind of take a pan out here and talk just a little bit more about primates before we focus on lemurs. So there are a couple of different large groups of primates out in the world. So there are apes like gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans. There are monkeys like spider monkeys and Allen swamp monkeys and black and white colobus monkeys. The list goes on. And then there are prosimians. So that's that kind of crazy word that I just said a couple of minutes ago. So prosimian, when you break that word down, it basically means pre-monkey, which means that prosimians like lemurs and um, borises, bush babies, tarsiers, those are all types of um, prosimians. And that means that they, they basically diversified millions of years ago, completely isolated. So they're going to look really different from some of the other primates that we, we may be used to seeing. Um, so they kind of have some special features. And we'll talk a little bit more about their features too. But I want to make sure to focus on what they're doing right now. So a lot of the time during the middle of the day, which this is sort of considered the middle of the day for them, they are resting. But today they just got enrichment. Now, again, there's a lot of kind of fancy science words, fancy zoo words here that we can use today. And enrichment is going to be anything that encourages natural behavior or promotes mental and physical stimulation for the animals. So you can see lots of types of enrichment just by glancing into their habitat right now. So if we take a close peek, and I'm not sure if this will allow me to zoom, but I will do my best, oh it does, perfect. So the two crowned lemurs, that are right here in the center are enjoying some popsicles. So it's kind of a warm day for us here in Chicago in comparison to how it has been. So popsicles are a nice treat. And these popsicles aren't necessarily gonna be the ones that you buy in the store, but they will be popsicles that are made by our nutrition staff here. So probably some sugar-free juice that are frozen into popsicle shape. 
Now along this kind of dip here in the middle, you'll also see some other types of fruits that are cut up and provided for them. This is a really great way to encourage those lemurs to explore their entire habitat for their food. This is really important because in the wild, lemurs would spend most of their time kind of searching around for food. Crowned lemurs eat a lot of fruit, so that's why you're seeing a lot of fruit here, and those popsicles made of fruit juice. But sometimes they'll also eat other things like bits of vegetation, bugs, seeds, really kind of anything that they can get their hands on, but they do prefer that fruit. You could also see some different sort of devices that are hanging from the branches in here, and you can kind of see some that are real close. There's just a bit of a shadow here. So these balls, the ones that are kind of straight back here, that brown ball with the hole is called a boomer ball. So this is gonna be a ball that's made of plastic and there's a hole inside and usually there's food items that are placed inside and then it can be hung really anywhere in this habitat. And you might be guessing, well, what in the world do they do with that if it's hanging on the tree? And what they'll do is they'll explore their habitat. They may be able to smell or see that there's food inside of there. And so then they're encouraged to use their hands and their minds to figure out how to get that food out of there. So that's a type of food enrichment that you're seeing. There are also some branches that are kind of hung from the trees here, and that is fresh mulberry brows. So they may eat pieces of this. They may also smell this or touch it, and that really the, encourages that physical stimulation of them exploring their habitats. For those of you who are kind of watching along here, you might notice that those lemurs are really excellent at jumping um, around in the trees. This species, the crowned lemur, does spend a lot of their time up in the trees, but they have been known to come down to the ground, kind of like this one lemur is right here in search for food. So all of this enrichment is going to encourage that behavior. Now, one thing that you cannot see, and I can't even smell it, is there is a special scent inside. Um, so I just watched one of the zookeepers come out right before this program started, and she was able to spray some perfume around the habitat. Something really special about lemurs is they use a lot of scent or olfactory communication. Um, they have scent glands on their body that they'll use to communicate with one another. So by spraying some of that perfume around their habitat, that really encourages them to kind of explore and figure out where is that smell coming from. You can even see some of those lemurs are smelling around at where she may have put that perfume. Now, kind of a funny story, not this particular type of lemur, but another type of lemur, a ring-tailed lemur. If you've ever seen the movie Madagascar, King Julian is a ring-tailed lemur, so you may have seen him before. That type of lemur, lemur does something called stink fighting. So we kind of learned that they have those scent glands. And what ring-tailed lemurs will do is they'll kind of produce some of that scent, they'll rub it on that long tail, and then they'll flick their tail about in order to communicate with other lemurs. And they have some really special adaptations, some of which you may have already noticed. Those tails are really long. They're, in fact, they're, they're longer than their bodies. And instead of using them for gripping like some monkeys do, they're going to use them for balance. So you've seen them sort of bouncing about among the trees and the branches. And what they'll do is they'll use that tail extended behind them to sort of balance them as they jump and move about the trees. I'm going to take a look at the chat and make sure I'm not missing any critical questions here. So how many different types of lemurs are there? That is a fantastic question. So crowned lemurs are one of about 40 species of lemurs that live only in Madagascar. Now, if you haven't, if you aren't sure where Madagascar is, I'm actually gonna pan over really quick to a sign that we have. And this is a map. So I'm zooming kind of close in on the continent of Africa and this little island that's off of the coast is Madagascar. Now that tip right there at the top is the only place that crowned lemurs live in that area. So it's a pretty small area. And what's cool about lemurs is that they only live 
on that island of Madagascar. You can't find them any place else in the world. Now, these three individuals, I saw a question about their names. I'm actually not sure of their names. Many of the animals that we house here at the zoo, um, they, they might have names that the keepers use for their record keeping, but for all intents and purposes, these are three male crowned lemurs. So if you have names for them, you are welcome to name them whatever you like in your home. Now they have some pretty cool adaptations, one of which is that tail that we just talked about. They also have something really interesting called a dental comb. So if you have, some of you may be losing teeth and regrowing them, some of you might have braces, I know I did when I was, when I was younger, um, and some of you may have all of your teeth in, in and those teeth on the bottom are going to be kind of in a row for us. Now for lemurs, those bottom six teeth in their mouth, including those sharp canine teeth, come together to form kind of like a comb structure. So I'm gonna show you kind of what my hand looks like here. They sort of come together like this and they curve upwards. Now that is used to help them groom one another. So they'll kind of get together in that social group. They usually live in groups of about four individuals all the way up to 15 individuals. And they'll use that comb and a special claw on their hand to groom one another. So this would be kind of like if you or I brushed each other's hair. So not only is it a nice thing to do for another individual, but it helps kind of strengthen that relationship in their troop. Let me see if we've got any other questions here. Okay, I think I've got the questions for now. And please make sure, um, feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions. I'm happy to answer anything about these particular animals. Like I said, they are my favorite. Now, you can kind of tell that they do have a skylight in here and they have a nice tall habitat, which provides them a great opportunity to move about their space as they would in the wild in the forest. Now, what's really interesting is I kind of mentioned earlier that they're oftentimes going to be pretty um, inactive during the middle of the day. Really, the only reason that they're this active right now is because we just provided them with some of that great enrichment. But this also leads back to one of their very special adaptations, um, which is night vision. So many lemurs have this very special kind of film in their eyes called a tapetum lucidum. What happens is when light hits their eyes, it reflects off of that tapetum lucidum and shines outwards. So imagine with me if you've ever been near a forest, if you've ever looked um, into the kind of a night area and you've seen eyes reflecting. Sometimes it looks a little spooky, which is how they got a nickname Ghost of the Forest in Madagascar. But what this does is it helps them see well at night. Oftentimes they're going to be pretty active right in the first light of the morning or in the afternoon, right as the sun is setting. Um, since they are pretty small animals, in fact, these are one of the smallest types of true lemurs, um, and they only weigh about four pounds um, when they're fully grown. So it's really important for them to be able to see well at night, not only to catch um, their food and be able to find their food, but also to make sure to protect themselves in the forest of Madagascar as well. So we're getting kind of a neat look here and these three individuals are all males. So this is really special because oftentimes lemurs are going to live in groups that are led by females female dominated. So what that means is that in the wild, in those, in those groups of lemurs that are upwards of, you know, 12 or 15 individuals, this means that the females are, are the ones who are in charge. They have first access to food. Oftentimes they'll get some of the best food items. They'll get to choose their mates first. Um, so I, I love any animal where girls run the world. So I appreciate that lemurs work like that. And here at the zoo, the reason that these particular individuals are all males is because they're in what's called a bachelor group. So lemurs, unfortunately, are endangered, and we want to make sure that we do everything that we can to protect them, both here at the zoo and in the wild. Now, we, per we participate in something called a species survival plan. So this is basically scientists making recommendations for which lemur should be housed together based on their their genetic information to make sure that we have a nice mixture of lemurs here in the zoo world. 
Now, these three individuals were not recommended to have a mate at a zoo, so we were able to house all three of them together so that they can be companions. This is a really neat opportunity to see something kind of special, which is those three males who live together in this habitat. Now I could talk about lemurs pretty much all day and some of their unique adaptations, but I don't wanna to take too much time away from answering any questions. Um, so this would be a great time for you to ask me any questions about lemurs here at the zoo or how we care for them. If there's not a lot of questions, I can talk a little bit more um, about how we care for the lemurs here, but I wanna make sure to give you time as well. Hey Jordan, I, I have some questions. Is John? Um, I know there's only three of the lemurs in um, here at the zoo, but if they were out in the wild, how big of a group of lemurs might be living together? That's a fantastic question. Um, so it's going to vary by species of lemur, mm -hmm. but for the crowned lemurs specifically, they usually live in groups of about four individuals to up to about 15 individuals. Wow. And usually when they're in the wild, they may separate off, you know, when they're foraging for food to be in slightly smaller groups. So maybe four, five, six together, um, but their groups can be pretty large. Yeah, that's great. And you did um, specifically point out how great they are at jumping. Um, do they have like a max height that they can jump to? That is a great question. They probably they probably do. They can jump very high and they can jump very wide. So their mm -hmm. vertical jump is um, probably just as long as their horizontal jump. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's tough to see kind of, kind of from this angle and with the shadows, but um, the they have extremely powerful hind legs. So all lemurs, whether they're big or small, um, have really powerful um, hind legs. So just as a comparison, I'll take a sort of a step back so you can kind of see how how tall or how large the habitat is. Um, I've mm -hmm. seen them jump very easily, almost completely to like probably three fourths of the way up those tallest trees in the back. Wow. Yeah, Definitely over there too, and quick. Yes, yes, they're very agile. And that's really important too, because even though there aren't a ton of predators, um, they don't have a lot of defense mechanisms. So really what they need to be able to do is move very quickly and um, be very agile up in the treetops. Yeah. Um, Nicholas is asking, will they have babies at the zoo? Oh, another great question. So these three in particular, probably not. Um, they will probably live as companions for most of the rest of their lives here at Lincoln Park Zoo. Now, sometimes that gets changed up. So we used to have a family group um, here at, at the zoo. And some of those dynamics change. We have older individuals that pass. Um, sometimes we'll have younger individuals will um, have babies. Um, sometimes they'll go and live at other zoos. So for right now, these three individuals will likely stay together and they won't be recommended to breed with another um, lemur but some of the individuals that used to live here have gone to other zoos to be recommended to have babies which is very cool it's really cool and uh, you said they like to eat a lot of fruit are they strict vegetarians or will they eat um anything else so many great questions. Um, so they, they're pretty strict vegetarians. <laughs> they, um, they will, with the exception of some insects. Um, so I guess they would, they're technically called frugivores, which means that they per, eat primarily fruit, um, but they will kind of expand their diet if they need to, to get a hold of other things like insects and little bits of seeds and, and vegetation and things like that. Um, but they won't eat they won't eat meat. I, I saw a bit of the skunk before, and I know that they're opportunistic feeders. Um, the lemurs are not quite like that. That's great. This is so cool being able to see them live here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they decided to give you a little show here yeah. right kind of towards the end. Um, and really probably what they'll do is this enrichment happens every single day. So it gets changed up every day. Sometimes um, there's there's like little kind of things hanging off of the branches here. So there's pinatas. Sometimes those have food items in it. They can tear those apart if they want to. They, I've seen them oftentimes sitting in this what kind of looks like a tire swing, but it's a, it's a piece of wood. Um, there is the stump over here. 
And there's like a mechanical feeder that will drop out bits of sugar free cereal. So it's a really cool environment um, to see how much vertical space they have. And they really utilize that and, and kind of spend some of that social time interacting with one another and their habitat. So this is definitely one of the most active times I've seen them. So I'm glad to, to be able to come to you with some, some action this morning. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, just for some information for our viewers. So the, the lemur house is currently closed, but the zoo itself is open currently, correct? That is correct. Yes. So right now the zoo is reopened. You can have uh, you can make free reservations for timed entries at lpzoo.org, lpzoo.org, um, and you can come and visit us. So all of the outdoor habitats are open, and we have two buildings that are currently open: the Regenstein African Journey Building and the McCormick Bird House. So if you're interested in coming to kind of check out the zoo, please feel free to make a reservation at your leisure, and eventually we. We obviously hope to reopen the Helen Brack Primate House as well, so you can say hi to your lemur friends. Well, awesome. Thanks again so much. It was great seeing uh, you and, and your lemur friends. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so glad we were able to uh, bring this opportunity to see uh, the lemurs to our viewers today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, I look forward to it, and please enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thanks so much. You too. Awesome, that was like really cool to be able to bring that um, experience live to you all. Um, right now, I think we have a special guest, I think. Hey, Jacob. Hi. How's it going? Thanks for joining us today. Jacob is a library patron, right? What? You you go to our libraries? Yeah, I go to the Chicago mm -hmm. Public Library. Um, it, well, I haven't been there in a long time, but my mom yeah. works there. Um, and today you're joining us because you're going to share with us your uh, pet, right? Yeah. All right. Is is your pet there with you? First we have Dylan. He's um, he, get on the screen. Dylan. Whoa. What's your name, Dylan? What? His name is Dylan. Yes. Hey, Dylan. What kind of dog is he? He's a boxer mix. I don't remember what. I can't. Sorry, I can't see here. Do you know how old um, Dylan is? Um, I believe he's... Why won't he stay on screen? That's yeah. okay. Um, he's about... He's what, six years old? Yeah. What, what's your favorite thing about Dylan? Um, eh, he's a good dog. I don't really have a favorite thing about him. Yeah. Does he, does he uh, know any tricks or anything? Um... Um, just barking whenever anything comes in and I don't know, five, five mile radius of our house count. Sure. Yeah, I, I don't have a dog anymore, but when I did, that's how my dog was too. He, he loved barking like, at strangers. He, he seems to notice every single thing in the radius of our house. Really? Yep, apparently. What, um, what's your, what's your uh, regular routine with uh, Dylan? I mean, he hasn't been out we haven't taken him for a walk in a while. He usually just sits around and sleeps all day. Sure. That sounds good. I wish I could do that all day, too. But, yeah, um, we let him out, but half the time he just stands on the porch and does nothing. Sure. For some reason. Sometimes you just need to relax, even dogs. Is yeah. uh, is Dylan your only pet, or do you have other pets, too? Um, no, we have another dog. His name is Bear. Bear. <laughs> oh, they're so cute. Sorry, Dylan, you're very cute too. Dylan's very cute also, but Bear, Bear is so cute. Bear is a Boston Terrier. He's um about 14, maybe 15 years old. Oh, wow. So he's pretty, he's a, he's a um, teenager dog, huh? Yeah. Do, um, do Dylan and Bear usually get along really well? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. They seem pretty chill together, though. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, cool. Thanks so much for sharing your pets. Hey, Bear. How um, how much does Bear weigh? He's, he's not too big, is he? Well, um, 
I don't know how much he weighs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Probably he's quite that. smaller than uh, Dylan, huh? Yeah. Very cool. But sadly, since Bear's an old dog, he's getting blind and deaf, so. Oh, no. Can't really listen much. Well, I hope I hope he does okay. Thank you so much for joining us, Jacob. I forgot to ask you, how, how old are you, Jacob? I am 13. 13, awesome. I'm so glad uh, you were able to join us today. I'm glad you use our libraries. I know um, I know your mom works at the library, so thank you to your mom also for helping uh, you join us today. We really appreciate it. And say say bye to Dylan and Bear for us. All right. Bear gets to be on screen one more time. Bye, Bear. And suppose Dylan can too. Bye, Dylan. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Bye. All right. Take care, Jacob. Awesome. That was really fun. Yeah, that was great. It was that, 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 nice to talk to the Lincoln Park Zoo and also Jacob with his pets. Um, but John, I heard you have a, a drawing activity for us. Yeah. So um, we're going to do a little drawing activity. So I, I need suggestions so people can start putting the names of different animals in the chat. So. Um, we're going to do like a fantasy animal activity. Some of you guys might know in uh, mythology, there's, um, I think it was from Greek mythology, there's an, a creature called a uh, chimera, which was basically a uh, hybrid animal. It was like a lion head with a goat body and a serpent's tail. Um, and there's also like some other hybrid type animals from different uh, literature, like you guys might know the hippogriff from the Harry Potter books. Um, so basically, I'm going to create a hybrid fantasy animal. So here's one I already made. This one, I start. I actually started with the name because I was just like brainstorming animals. And then I know it's backwards, but this is actually an octopotopus. Can you guys tell what animals this is made out of? I see an octopus, platypus. Yeah. Uh, what's the head shape? Oh, so the head is the octopus plus oh. kind of like morphing into a hippo. Oh, nice. Plata part and then the platypus tail and the it has web platypus feet. Um, I also made another one. This one I did start with the name also. This is called a gerantula. So it's part giraffe, part tarantula. It's very creepy. <laughs> I know. I, I was like, oh, I didn't mean for it to be so scary, but I guess tarantulas are pretty scary. So, you know, I was doing a little research. There's actually like real live um, hybrid animals. I, do you know what a tigon is? Uh, what's a tiger? A tigon is part tiger, part lion. And there's also another animal called a liger, which is also part lion, part tiger. And I think it depends on which um, parent is the male, which is the female. But um, there's also an animal called a wolfin. Can you guess what a wolfin is? I'm going to guess a walrus and a dolphin. Close. It's a whale and a dolphin. Uh. And then this one was really cool. If you, um, I wish I could pull up an image, but you guys can Google this. It's called a jag lion. Can you guess what that is? Um, I guess a lion and a jaguar. Yes, it was like really cool. I never even uh, heard of those. So, um, if people can give me some suggestions of some animals, I'm going to draw a little uh, chimera. Um, if you want to start with a fun name, maybe you can. Um, some some fun names I came up with were a, a Sela monkey. That's a good one. <laughs> well, we're gonna start with um, with a lemur since we learned about lemurs today. And okay. while I get some comments, some suggestions, I'm gonna go ahead and share some books. Um, well, actually, Liv is gonna share some books about pets. So get started on that drawing, and I'll, I'll pop up some suggestions. Thanks, John. Sounds good. Alfie, the turtle that disappeared. This is a picture book with two narrators, a girl named Nia and a turtle named Alfie. Our story begins on Nia's sixth birthday when she gets the best birthday present ever, a turtle named Alfie. Nia loves Alfie. She draws pictures for him, dances for him, and even sings to him. But Alfie can't speak and turtles move slowly. Does Alfie love Nia? Nia isn't sure. Then, one day, Alfie disappears. Where did he go? Alfie narrates the second half of this story and it's a big adventure for a little turtle. But don't worry, Nia and Alfie find their way back to each other and 
In an author's note, Thyra Hedder shares a story about her pet tortoise who gave her the idea to write this book. Manco Abuela and Me. Abuela was Mia's faraway grandmother, but now she is Mia's new roommate. Mia is excited, except for one thing. Mia's Spanish is poquito. How will she and Abuela communicate? Cooking lessons are a great start, but it's the arrival of a pet parrot, Mango, that really get these two, I mean three, talking. Mango, Abuela, and Me is also available in Spanish. King and Kayla and the case of the missing dog treats. King is a golden retriever. Kayla is his favorite girl, and together they solve mysteries. In this first book and a new series, King's nose knows who stole the puppy treats. Will you be able to help Kayla solve the mystery? If you like a good mystery, this is the first book in the King and Kayla series by Dory Hillstead Butler. My Furry Foster Family, Buttons the Kitten. Meet Kaida Takano. She's eight years old and she and her family have the coolest hobby ever. They foster or care for pets until the pets find a forever family. Kaita and her parents have fostered a bearded dragon, two hamsters, a puppy, and in this book they foster an entire litter of kittens. But who will adopt the shyest kitten? To read more about Kaita's adventures, be sure to check out the My Furry Foster Family series by Debbie Mashiko Florence. Juana and Lucas Juana and her dog Lucas live in Bogota, Colombia. Juana is a fan of many things, drawing, astroman, her family, recess. Learning English? Nada de fun. But her abuelo thinks otherwise and he has the perfect bribe, a trip to Florida to visit Spaceland and meet Astro Man who only speaks English. If you love Sadia Faruqi's Meet Yasmin or Annie Barrow's Ivy and Bean, you'll want to meet Mona and Lucas. St. Louis Armstrong Beach. When Hurricane Katrina forces residents of New Orleans' Treme neighborhood to evacuate, 11-year-old St. Louis Armstrong Beach, an aspiring young jazz musician, is all packed up to leave town with his family. But he can't bring himself to leave Shadow, the neighborhood dog, or old Ms. Moran, an elderly neighbor, behind. So he heads back into the hurricane to find them. The OK Witch Moth Hush has spent her whole life in sleepy little Founders Bluff, Massachusetts. Moth lives with her mother above their second-hand treasure shop, Finders Keepers, and spends most of her time reading, preferably about witches and fantasy realms. But she never dreamed either existed until her 13th birthday, when her power manifests in a startling way. Finding out you're a witch sounds cool, but actually being a witch? Well, it's a little harder than you might think. Luckily, Moth has a magical talking black cat named Mr. Laszlo to guide her. All right, John, how's it going? Um, okay, I think. So I, I took your suggestion of the lemur. Someone said shark and someone said bird. So my shark looks a little funny. It doesn't exactly look like a shark, but <laughs> I got to come up with a cool name for this. I, I saw somebody suggested a uh, chimpanroo, which sounds really cool. I think I'm guessing that's a chimpanzee kangaroo. So I encourage you kids at home to try making your own hybrid uh, chimera animal. You can start with a, a fun name or maybe just brainstorm some different animals you uh, you want to draw and combine them into a fantastical new creature. Yeah, and then um, send your drawings to us. We'd love to see what you guys create. You can send it to uh, cplkids at shypublib.org. Um, but no, I think this turned out really cool. I wonder um, what, what kind of, uh, what does this uh, animal eat, John? <laughs> um. I'm not sure. I think it's a vegetarian too, despite it having like really sharp teeth. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's it just, it's, uh, if, I forgot the term that, uh, for the lemurs, they're fruitarians or something. Yeah. <laughs> that was very cool. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we had a lot of fun learning about different animals and getting to meet um, some of your animals as well. So uh, next month, uh, we'll have our second Saturday um, on April the 10th and we're going to focus on inventions and um, DIY activities 
we're actually going to have a lot of kid adventures on um, on the program. So please tune into that, and um, we hope to see you next month. John, do you have anything else to say before we go? Thanks to our guests for joining us, uh, Jacob, Lincoln Park Zoo, and Animal Quest, and we'll see you all next month. All right, take care. Bye, everyone. Bye.